Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Beach House 34 True Crime Podcast. What we're going to do today is we are going to be reading the trial testimony uh, for Darley Routier, and this is part three. We are now on day two of the trial, which occurred on January 7th, 1997. Now, before we begin, I want to give a little disclaimer. If you hear any um, shocking background noises, uh, they're doing some work around the area. So um, if you do, I apologize. Um, this is going to be going on for some time and just kind of I had to get this this episode out. So anyway, let's go ahead and continue. If you've been listening up to this point, you know the background behind the story. And so I'm not going to repeat it here, just mainly to save time. If you're interested in hearing the entire background, you can listen to the whole story, the whole Darley story, uh, which actually started as a three-part episode and then went into her hearing uh, to hold her without bond. And then finally, the actual jury trial, which is where we're at right now. I'll have all of the links of all of these shows for you in the show notes. So if you do want to go back, it'll be easy to determine where to go. Now, up to this point, we have heard the opening statements and testimony from Dr. Joni McLean, who performed the autopsy on Devin Routier, the older of the two boys, Dr. Janice Townsend Parchman, who performed the autopsy on Damon Routier, the younger of the boys, and testimony from a neighbor by the name of William Gorsuch. Now, to give you an overview of the players, I'll quickly go over some of those names so that you are also familiar with them. The prosecuting attorney is Assistant District Attorney Greg Davis. He's been on the case since day one. He has a team of four additional attorneys, and so far, it's been Mr. Davis who's been asking the questions. Whenever the prosecutor asks asking the questions, if this happens to change, I will definitely let you know. Next, we have the defense attorney, Doug Mulder. He had limited time to prepare for the case, and this was because Darley's mother decided to seek out new counsel for her shortly before the trial began. Mr. Mulder also has a team, but he's got a team of three attorneys. And again, Mulder is usually the one asking the questions, but if this changes, I'll let you know. There are a couple of additional attorneys who do show up uh, to represent the officers who will be testifying in this and the next um, the next uh, reading. And as they appear, if they appear in the documentation, I will mention them. The case, if you remember, had been moved from the Dallas area to a place called Kerrville, Texas, an extremely conservative town where it was said that if you want to guarantee a conviction, move it to Kerrville. I also want to point out that as I read this, it's the very first time I am reading it as well. And the only reason I say this is because today we dive into the testimony of the first officer on the scene, David Waddell, who also, if you remember, testified in the hearing to hold Darley without bond. I may end up being surprised at what he says here compared to what he said in the bond hearing. I'm not sure. At the end of this testimony, I may have a few opinions. I might not. We'll have to see what he says. Like I said, this too is my first time reading through everything. So we're kind of in this together. And one last thing. After I've done the reading, I realized that the entire trial um, is actually very non-descriptive. And what I mean by that is that Oftentimes you'll hear, okay, so you were standing over here or you went, quote, this direction, which really doesn't help you. So what I'm going to do is that any document uh, regarding pictures or whatever that I can share, I'm going to add to the show notes so that you have some kind of orientation to refer to when they get to these portions. Um, With all of that said, We begin with the testimony of the first officer on the scene, Officer David Waddell. And the questioning begins with the prosecuting attorney, Mr. Greg Davis. Would you please tell us your full name? David Wayne Waddell. And Mr. Waddell, how are you employed at this time? I'm a police officer for the city of Plano. All right, and where exactly is Plano? It's just north of Dallas. How long have you been with the Plano Police Department? 
about five months. Before coming to work for Plano, how were you employed? For the city of Rowlett as a police officer. All right, how old are you? 32. Have you got a family? Yes, I do. Okay, kids? Yes, I do. What are their ages? Seven and one. Now, how long had you been a Rowlett police officer? Four and a half years. And before that, had you been a police officer at some other city there in Dallas County? Yes. And what city would that have been? Glen Heights. Okay, how long were you with Glen Heights? Nine months. And prior to Glen Heights, had you been in law enforcement in any capacity? I was a reserve police officer. Where? Where? For the city of Heath. And is Heath in Rockwall County? Yes, it is. Just, basically, it's just east of Dallas County, right? Yes. Now, when you were with the Rowlett Police Department, what was your rank? I was a patrol officer. And what were your duties? I was assigned to a beat to answer calls every day. Officer, I want to direct your attention back to June the 5th of 1996. Do you recall whether or not you were on duty that day? I was. And what were your hours to work? 9.30 to 6 a.m. Okay, so it would be 9.30 p.m. to 6 a.m. Is that right? Yes, sir. Were you in uniform that night? Yes, I was. Were you in a marked patrol car? Yes, I was. Were you working by yourself or with another officer? By myself. I want to now move forward to June the 6th at approximately 2.30 a.m. Were you still on patrol? Yes, sir. Do you recall where you were at about 2.30 in the morning? I was in the parking lot of Victory Baptist Church. Victory Baptist Church? Yes, sir. Is that in Rowlett? Yes, it is. Where is that located? In Rowlett. It's right about in the middle of the city off Highway 66, beside the lake. Okay. At this point, Mr. Greg Davis turns to the judge and says, Your Honor, may I please approach? And the court says, You may. Then Mr. Greg Davis says, Officer Waddell, just looking here at this map of Rowlett, can you just point out where the Victory Baptist Church would have been? About right here. Okay. Do I have my finger there where that would have been? Yes, sir. All right. It's just, I guess, sort of on that eastern portion, kind of the peninsula portion of Rowlett. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And is it, is that unusual for you to sit in the parking lot up there? No, sir. Okay. Do you recall whether or not you were doing anything specific when you were up there? No, sir. Did anything unusual catch your attention as you were sitting in your squad car at 2.30 in the morning out there at the Baptist Church. I heard the fire tones go off. What do you mean fire tones? Well, whenever a dispatcher sends the fire department somewhere, they set off the tones on the police radio as well as the fire channel. Okay, your radio in your car, does it have the ability to monitor that radio channel also? Yes, it does. All right, and following the emergency tones, what's the next thing that you heard come over your radio? I switched over to the fire channel and heard them dispatch the fire department to 5801 Eagle on a stabbing. On a stabbing? Yes, sir. And did you do anything in response to hearing that over your radio? I headed that way. Okay, headed toward 5801 Eagle Drive? Yes, sir. Do you recall whether or not you switched on your emergency lights? I did. Now, Officer Waddell, do you know how far it is from the Victory Baptist Church where you were to 5801 Eagle Drive? 1.9 miles. And do you know how long it took you that morning to get from your location to 5801 Eagle Drive? Two to three minutes. Now, on the way to that location, Officer did you see any vehicles speeding away from the neighborhood where 5801 Eagle Drive is located? No, sir. Did you see anyone out that morning on foot as you were going toward 5801 Eagle Drive? No, sir. Did you see anything at all unusual or suspicious as you went toward that location, sir? No, sir. 
did you finally arrive at 5801 Eagle Drive? Yes, I did. Were you the first police officer on the scene? Yes, sir. As you entered the neighborhood there, did you see any vehicles on the roadway? No. Did you see any persons on foot in the neighborhood as you approached the house? Just Darren Routier. All right. And when you say Darren Routier, do you know him now to be Darren Routier? Yes, I do. Had you ever seen him before that morning? No, sir. Let me back up for a moment. 5801 Eagle Drive, is that a location in the county of Dallas? Yes, it is. And the state of Texas? Yes. Do you recall where you parked your car that morning? I parked on the north side of the house. Okay. And do you recognize this aerial photograph as 5801 Eagle Drive? Yes, sir. And north is toward the top side of this photograph. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Mr. Greg Davis says, and can the witness please step down? And the court says, yeah, please step down, officer. Watch your step. And then Mr. Greg Davis continues. And if you would, officer, if you will step to the side so that all the jurors can see where you're pointing, can you just point for us where you parked your vehicle that morning? Right here on this curve. Mr. Douglas Mulder, the defense attorney, then stands up and says, judge, could we see it? And the court says, by all means, come on around. By all means, come on around. Mr. Greg Davis then says, we will move it around here a little bit further over here. Mr. Greg Davis then continues. I'll tell you what, let's roll it out a little bit further out here. Would you again point for us where you parked your squad car that morning? Right here along this curve. All right. And as you came up here to this location, officer, is that when you saw the individual that you now know to be Darren Routier? Yes, sir. Can you please point where he was when you first saw him? He was coming out the front door across the yard. All right. Do you recall how he was dressed that morning? He was wearing blue jeans, no shirt, no shoes. Okay. Do you remember whether or not he was saying anything? as he came out. He was saying something, but at that time I didn't know what it was. All right. Did you have your gun drawn as you came up to that location? Yes, I did. All right. And why did you have your gun drawn? I didn't know if he was a suspect or I didn't know who he was. All right. You know you had a stabbing call, right? Right. What did you do then as you came up here and you saw this individual running out of the house? I hollered at him to stop, and then I walked over and met him in front of the fountain there. Okay, what happened when you met him over there? He told me that his kids had been stabbed and that they were dying. What did you do then? After he told me that, he started going back into the house, and I followed him inside the house. All right. Now, officer, had you had any experience in dealing with crimes involving violence before? Yes. Okay. What kind of offenses had you been involved with prior to June the 6th, 1996? I worked on a homicide about two months before this one. And you had been a police officer how long with Rolette? About four and a half years. Okay. I guess you had answered a lot of other calls during that time period. Yes, sir. Had you received any other specialized training as a member of the Rolette Police Department? Yes, I had. And what kind of training had you received? In April of 1993, I went to a 24-hour crime scene school. I was also on the special response team for the police department. What is the special response team? It's a team that we we served a lot of high-risk search warrants and arrest warrants. Okay, did you receive any specialized training to become a member of the specialized response team? We trained about 16 hours a month. And we went to a 60-hour school in Austin, a SWAT school. Okay, so as I understand it, you said Darren Routier entered the residence. Is that right? Yes, sir. And you followed him into the residence? Yes. Whereupon some uh, items were marked for identification only as States Exhibit 10, after which time the proceedings were resumed on the record. Mr. Greg Davis then continues uh, his questioning. Mr. Waddell. Let me show you what has been marked as State's Exhibit Number 10. Do you recognize this to be a layout of the floor plan of 5801 Eagle Drive? Yes. 
Does it accurately reflect the rooms as they appeared there in June of 1996? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, we will offer State's Exhibit Number 10. Mr. Mulder says no objection. The court says State's Exhibit Number 10 is admitted. Mr. Greg Davis then says, if you could, officer, if we could just go through the general layout there of the house. Is this the front door that I'm pointing to right here? Yes. As you come in, we've got labeled the living room. Is that the more formal area? Yes. And we have a family room, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. The entryway? Yes, sir. This is a two-story home, is it not? Yes, it is. All right. Is this the stairway that leads up to the second floor? Yes, it is. Okay, the kitchen, utility room, breakfast nook, and dining room, correct? Yes, sir. And the garage in this residence is attached to the house itself? Yes. And is it toward the rear of that house? Yes, it is. If you will, please tell the members of the jury where you came once you came into the front door of that residence. Where did you first go to? I could see a person standing there. I could see the defendant right here. I walked up this little hallway and stopped right here for a second. Okay. Did you notice anything unusual here in the entryway? I noticed some blood on the floor. All right. What did you do in response to that? I saw the blood. I attempted not to step in it and disturb any of it. All right. You said that you saw someone go someone back here. Did you actually go through the entryway then? Yes. And where did you go then? I went straight to the defendant who was standing right here. All right. If you could, let me give you a red pen. And officer, I would like for you, if you would, to just place an X where you saw the defendant. And let me ask you first, do you see the defendant in the courtroom this morning? Yes. Could you please point her out? She is right over here. Okay, she's the female sitting at the council table over there in the gray jacket. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Your Honor, may the record please reflect that this witness is identifying the defendant in open court. Yes, sir. Sir, if you would, please take this red pen and just place an X at the position where you first saw the defendant when you came into the residence. The witness then complies. All right, and if you would, if you'll just write above that defendant. And if you would, when you came in here, did you see any other persons inside that room when you came into the family room? I noticed a small child laying on the ground right here. All right. Would you put another X and label that as small child, please, where you saw him? Okay. Did you see anybody else when you came in there? Darren Routier had gone across the living room and there was another child on the floor on the other side. And if you could, if you'll put an X and then put label that as, quote, second child, please. Okay. All right. As I understand then, when you came in, let me first ask you, did I understand you to say that Darren Routier had gone over here to the second child? Yes. Had you asked him to do that? At that point, I had not. All right. When you saw the defendant here standing, please describe for us what she was doing at that time. She was holding a towel over her neck with one hand and talking on the telephone with the other. All right. Was that a cordless telephone or is that a telephone that was connected to an outlet? It was a cordless phone. Can you describe how she was dressed that morning? A light colored t-shirt. Okay. Anything else? Nothing else. Was she wearing any shoes that you could see? No, sir. Okay. Was she barefoot? Yes. How would you describe her demeanor when you first saw her? What was she doing or what was her demeanor? She appeared to be upset and hysterical. And when you say upset or hysterical, what do you mean by that? She was screaming and yelling. All right. Was she doing that to you or someone else or to anyone in particular? I thought she was talking on the telephone still. All right. Tell us what's the next thing that you recall happening when you came in here and saw her. I could see this child's feet right here and I walked around his feet. I approached the defendant and I asked her who had done it and where were they at? She couldn't give me a description of who had done it, 
but she told me that whoever it was was still in the garage. All right. And did you know at the time that the garage was back here? No. Okay. Did she indicate in any way where the garage was? She pointed to it and told me that direction. Okay. So did she point over toward this portion of the house then? Yes. Okay. What did you do then? Or what's the next thing that happened at that point? I instructed Darren Routier to try to help the second child over there with some type of first aid. I told him to apply pressure to some of the wounds to try and stop the bleeding. And the second child being this child over in this portion of the room. Yes. All right. Did Darren follow your instructions? Yes. All right. What did you see him do? I saw him on his hands and knees beside the child. I couldn't tell exactly what he was doing. It looked to me like he was trying to give him CPR or putting pressure on his wounds. Okay, did he say anything to you when he went over here and started to do whatever it was he was doing? He told me that it was no use, that he was blowing air through his chest. Okay, what about this child over here? Let's go back to this child. Do you recall how this smaller child was dressed that morning? He had on long pants and a shirt. All right, let me ask you, was there anything on his back, such as a towel, a rag, anything else besides the clothing that he was wearing, officer? No. After Darren Routier tells you that he's blowing into this child's mouth here or his chest, what's the next thing that you recall happening? I told the defendant to go get some towels and put on the first child's back to try to stop his bleeding. Now, when you said that to her, first of all, let me back up. At the time that Darren Routier is over here, doing whatever he's doing with this second child, where is the defendant? She's in the same position. She's still over here across the room? Yes, sir. Where are you? I'm right beside her. Okay, so you've moved over here to this area. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Is there a countertop or bar here that separates the family room and the kitchen room? Yes. And can you actually see through the family room into the kitchen room? Yes. Let me ask you, officer. At the time that Darren Routier was making whatever efforts he was with the second child, did any blood get on you? No. Okay. Did you see any blood fly across this room over here on to this defendant? No, sir. All right. Let's move forward here again. When you told the defendant to go over here and find something and apply pressure to this child, what, if anything, did she do? She stayed in the same place she was and told me that the suspect was still in the garage. All right. And what did you do in response to that? I went into the kitchen and tried to look into the garage. All right. Well, let me back you up here. This child is obviously injured, correct? Yes. You've asked her to go over and assist him, correct? Yes. She doesn't do that. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Why didn't you then drop down? You're trained in CPR. Yes. Why didn't you then go down here and start applying the pressure that this child needed at that point yourself? Because the suspect was still in the house, as far as I knew. Okay. Are there certain procedures that you've been trained to follow when you go out to a scene such as this? Yes, sir. Are there certain priorities? Yes, sir. Okay, could you tell the members of the jury what are the priorities? What are the things that you're supposed to do when you confront a scene like this? First of all, we try and find out if the suspect is still in the house or not, if they are still at the location. Secondly, would be to get medical attention where needed. And the third thing would be to preserve the crime scene. Okay, and Officer Waddell, at the time that you asked the defendant to care for this child, had you located a suspect? No. Had you gotten the information from the defendant concerning the suspect? Not at that time. All right. Did you believe one to still be in the house? Yes, I did. Okay, and where did you believe him to be? She told me he was in the garage, and I assume that's where he was. All right. And I believe you said that you, in fact, started to go to the garage. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And if you could, just with this pen, not writing, but if you would just indicate for the members of the jury, you know, where you went to as you first went toward that garage area. 
I was over here by her. I came around the bar and I walked into the kitchen to about right here, enough to where I could look through the utility room. There's a door here. I was trained to look through the door into the garage. You know, when you're doing that, are there any lights on inside the house? Yes. Okay. What light is on in the family room, if you recall? I remember the TV being on. Okay. This black object here, is that a big screen television that's in there? Yes, sir. Was that television on when you first entered the family room? Yes. How about in the kitchen area? What lighting is there available for you there? There was an overhead light on when I went in there. How about the utility room back here? Was there a light on in there? I don't recall if that light was on or not. So as I understand, you then went about halfway into the kitchen here, right? Did you go any further? No, no. When you were at this position, officer, did you see anyone back there? No, sir. Did you hear anyone back there? No. Why didn't you go any further than halfway through this kitchen at that point, Officer Waddell? I couldn't see into the garage, and I wasn't positive that that's where the suspect was. I knew he was still in the house at the time, is what we thought, and I didn't want to leave all of them back in the living room with the suspect loose in the house somewhere. Do you know how long you were gone from the time you left here to go back here to the kitchen to the time that you came back? About how much time has elapsed at that point? Maybe 30 or 40 seconds? And when you come back, is the smaller child still in the same position here? Yes. How about the second child? Is he still in the same position over here? Yes. How about the defendant? Where is the defendant when you come back from the kitchen area? In the same position. Basically the same position as we have marked here with the X. Yes, sir. She's not over here with a small child? No. What's she doing? She was still yelling. I don't know if she was still on the telephone or not, but she was still yelling to get help. Okay. How about Darren? Do you recall where he was when you came back from the kitchen? I think he was still over at the second child. Was there anything at all to indicate to you that the defendant had moved from her original position in the time period that you had gone to the kitchen and come back? Anything at all to indicate that? No. You come back into this area again. Now, what do you do? I asked her again for a description of the suspect, and she told me she didn't know if it was a white guy or a black guy but that he was wearing a black shirt, dark pants, and a ball cap. Again, a ball, black ball cap and dark shirt? Yes, sir. Didn't know whether he was white or black? Right. Okay. Did she give you any other information at that time about this person or what may have happened? She told me what had happened. Okay. Just tell the members of the jury what the defendant told you had happened right there. She told me that she had got into a fight with somebody that broke into her house. She fought with the suspect. She told me she fought with him at the end of the bar here and that he ran across the kitchen. All right. Did she describe what kind of fight had occurred here in this area? She just said that he, she had fought with him. All right. Are you sure it was this area that she was indicating to? Yes, sir. How was she indicating that area between the family room and the kitchen as being the place of struggle? As she was telling me, she was walking in this direction and she pointed right to that area. All right. If you could, officer, please take the red pen again. Just put an X at the place where she says the struggle occurred and just label that as struggle. Okay. All right, now if we can, if we can pick this up from the point where she is now giving the description. She has told you what's happened. She's now pointed out the place where this struggle occurred. What's the next thing that you recall happening? We both, we walked back over to this area here and I could see that this child here was lying on the floor on his stomach, on his left side of his face. And he was looking up at both of us making some noises like he was trying to breathe. All right, if you could, if we could position him in general, Can you describe how this child was laying, you know, where his feet were and where his head was? His feet were right here and his head was on this end. Okay, 
So you've got his head here, basically, and his feet are closer to the hallway. Is that correct? Yes. He's on his stomach? Yes, sir. And you say that he had his head turned where he's looking up at you. Does he have his head turned in this fashion then? Yes, sir. And when he does that, can you just point with the pointer where you and the defendant are at this point? Right here in this area. Are you able to see his face? Yes. Are you able to see what he's doing? Yes. Okay, and the defendant is right here next to you. Is that right? Yes, sir. This child here, this small child, could you see whether or not his eyes were open at that point? They were open. And was he looking in your direction? Yes. Was he making any sort of noise? Yes, he was. And what sort of noise was he making? Like a gasping type noise. Okay, so this child, this child was not dead at this point, was he? No. What did you do then? I instructed her to get some towels and put them on his back to try and stop the bleeding. And what did she do? Nothing. She kept telling me that when she chased the suspect across the kitchen, that he had dropped the knife by the utility somewhere over here in this area, and that she had picked up the knife and brought it back and set it on the counter. And she told me that she thought she had messed up the fingerprints. Well, at that time, Officer Waddell, that you asked her again to care for this child over here, this child with his eyes open, did you feel that she was capable of rendering assistance to this child? Yes, sir. Okay. Why do you think that she was capable of rendering assistance to this child? Well, she appeared to know everything that was going on inside the house. She was real alert and able to tell me what had happened. I thought if she was worried about fingerprints on a knife, she could certainly take care of her kids. Okay, she didn't go over there? No. And again, let me just ask you again, this second time when you requested that she assist this child and she didn't, why didn't you yourself go over here and do that? At that point, I didn't know where the suspect was. I thought he was still in the house. I positioned, positioned myself between, between them and the rest of the house. This was the only way to get into this room. I positioned myself right here until I could get another backup officer to help me clear the house. Okay, what happens if you go over here and start tending to him and you have a suspect come into the room? Then he stabs me too. Okay, you positioned yourself in this area. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, what's the next thing that happened? I waited there until Sergeant Walling arrived, which was, it wasn't too long after that. What was the purpose of waiting for a second officer before you did anything else? It's procedure to wait on another officer, and this was certainly a life-threatening situation. And I didn't want to walk out in the garage not knowing what was there in there by myself. Okay. You said the second officer's name is Matt Walling. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Also a member of the Rowlett Police Department? Yes, sir. At the time, he was a sergeant? Yes, he was. Is he one of the shift supervisors? Yes. And did he, in fact, enter the residence and meet up with you then? Yes, he did. And when, I think at the time, was a sergeant, correct? Yes. Now he's a lieutenant? Yes, sir. When Lieutenant Walling came in, can you tell the members of the jury what you and Lieutenant Walling did then? He came in and met me right where I was standing. I briefed him on what happened and that the suspect was probably still in the house somewhere, most likely in the garage. And then we walked through the kitchen and went into the garage to check and see if anybody was in there. This rectangular object here in the kitchen area, what is that? That's a small island in the kitchen. All right. And do you recall how you and Lieutenant Walling actually went from this area back through the utility room? Yes, sir. We came this way around the island and around this way. All right. And just so we can orient, these green tri rectangles, are those rugs? Yes. All right. This circular object? What is that circular object there in the kitchen? I believe it was a wine rack. So you then went past the wine rack and then you went to the right of the island. Is that right? Yes. Could you see anything on the floor of the kitchen as you went in that direction? There was blood on the floor and a broken wine glass. I remember seeing the wine glass and the blood. 
Okay, what did you do in response to that? I stepped over it. Okay, did you, in fact, get back to the utility room? Yes. Is there a door that separates the kitchen and the utility room? Yes. That morning, do you recall whether or not the door was open or not? It was open. Did both you and Lieutenant Walling go into the utility room then? Yes. Is there a door here that separates the utility room from the garage? Yes. All right. That morning when you went into the utility room, was that door opened or was it closed? This door here was closed. All right. And that would be the door that separates the house from the garage. Correct? Yes, sir. Could you see any sort of damage to that door? Wood broken off, chips, anything to indicate that there had been a forced entry made on that door. No, sir. What's the next thing that happened when you and Lieutenant Walling went back to the utility room? Lieutenant Walling opened the door and then it was dark inside. So he scanned across the way with his flashlight and he stepped in and went to the left. And I went in the doorway and looked to the right. Okay. Do you know how far into the garage Lieutenant Walling went? I'm not for sure exactly how far it was. It wasn't real far. You say that he scanned with his flashlight. Were the lights on in this garage here? No. Okay. Did you have your flashlight out also? Yes, I did. Okay. And he scanned toward the left. Is that right? Right. Did you actually step into the garage yourself? I was right in the doorway. All right. And you scanned toward the right portion of the garage. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Did you see anyone? when you went out there into the garage? No. Did you hear anyone out in the garage? No. Did Lieutenant Walling stay in the garage or did he come back in? He came right back in. And when y'all, when both of you are now in the utility room, what's the next thing that happens? Lieutenant Walling told me that he saw the cut screen on the window. All right. If you could, just to kind of orient the jury, We've got some areas up here. Does this garage have several windows on this wall of the garage? Yes. And this area here, just the white area, is that basically, that's the backyard, is it not? Yes, sir. Okay, would you label that as backyard? Yes, sir. And the windows then would look out into the backyard from the garage. Is that right? Yes. All right. And he told you that he saw a screen that had been cut on one of these windows. Yes, sir. All right. Did you step out to look at it at that time? No. Okay. What did you do? I turned around and went back to the kitchen where they were. And if you could, with a pointer, just indicate the route that you took when you went back into the utility room, through the kitchen, back to the family room. What route did you take? A different route or the same route? It was the same route right through here around the island and back right over to this area. Okay, how about Lieutenant Walling? Did he follow you back into the living room? No. Okay, did you see where he went? I didn't see where he went. No, sir. Okay, did he tell you that he was going to go someplace else though? Yes, sir. Okay, where did he say he was going to go? He told me he was going to go around to the backyard. All right. Why didn't you go to the backyard with him? I was going back over here because the house still wasn't secured at that time. I went back over here with them. I believe there was another officer coming to meet Lieutenant Walling. Okay, well, at the time that y'all are coming back, had you had an opportunity to make a full search of this formal living room? No, sir. How about the breakfast in this area? Did you have a chance to make a complete search of it also? No, sir. How about the formal dining room? Have you had a chance to make a full search of it also? No. Bathroom in here? No, sir. Had anybody at that point gone to any of the upstairs rooms to check them out? No, sir. So you came back in here and Lieutenant Walling leaves the house to go to the backyard. Is that right? Right. As you come back in here, officer, is there anybody still in this family room? Yes, sir. Okay. Could you just tell us who is still in the family room when you came back? The defendant's still in the family room. And where is she? Still right. She's over in this area right here. 
do you remember what she's doing when you come back? I don't remember exactly what she was doing, just standing there. Did you look over to see whether or not a rag or towel or anything had been placed on the back of this smaller child? Yes, sir. And what was the result? There was none. So the defendant is still over in this area near the kitchen bar. Do you remember whether or not her husband, Darren, was still in the room at that time? I think he was. I'm not for sure. He came, he was in there shortly after I got back in there. Okay, the second child is still in the same position? Yes. At any point, did any other persons come into this family room? Yes. Okay, who else came into the family room? The paramedics. From the Rowlett Fire Department? Yes, sir. Can you describe briefly how they came in and where they went to? When they came in, I was standing right here beside the defendant. At that time, her husband was in there, Darren. I told both of them to come back over here and sit down up against the sliding glass doors and kind of stay out of the way. Okay, is there a sliding glass door that's on this portion of the room that leads from the family room back out into the garage? It leads into the backyard. Yeah, into the backyard. Okay. From the family room into the backyard. Also, some windows across this portion of the room. Is that right? Yes, sir. And then we've indicated some furniture. There's two couches. Is that correct? Yes, sir. They've got a coffee table. Yes. And a chair over in this location, right? Yes, sir. And is the fireplace over in this portion of the room? Yes. We've got a rectangular space here. What is that over there? Do you recall? I don't recall what it was. You indicated that you had them come over to this area of the family room close to the sliding glass door. Is that right? Yes, sir. Did they go over there? Yes, sir. Okay. How many paramedics came in? Two initially. All right. And where did they go to? The first paramedic went to this child and the second one came right over here to this child. Okay. Over here on this diagram, we've indicated this couch to be up closer to the window. In fact, is there a little bit more space between this couch and the windows back here? Mr. Mulder then stands up and says, object to leading. The court then says, overruled, go ahead. The witness then responds, yes, sir, there is. Mr. Greg Davis then says, okay, and again, with the pointer, if you will, just indicate how the paramedic traveled to reach the second child, if you recall. He came around this way. I don't know which route he took. I know he walked past me and around this way. Do you know the name of the paramedic that went over here to care for this second child? I think his first name is Brian. I'm not sure. Do you recall the name of the paramedic that went to the smaller child? No. What's the next thing you saw happen? Well, this paramedic moved over here to pick this child up and took him outside. Now, I don't normally do this, but I'm going to interject something here um, because it gets a little confusing, uh, mainly because there's first child, second child, etc. The only child that was picked up and taken out of the Routier residence in order to be attended to was the younger child who was Damon. And Damon was the one who was laying in between the family room and the kitchen area. So just to kind of help give you a little bit of bearing as to which child they are referring to. So let's go back. Now, during this time period that the paramedic is working on this first child, over there, over here. Is the defendant still over here? Yes. While the first child is still in the house, did you ever hear the defendant ask anyone in that room about the condition of this first child? No. Did you ever hear her say anything at all concerning this first child that's laying over here? No. While the paramedic was working on this second child over here, did you ever hear the defendant make any inquiries about the condition of this second child? No. Did you ever ask her? Did you ever hear her say anything regarding the second child that was being worked on by this paramedic? No. When the paramedic took this child out, how did he take him out of the house? What route did he take? He picked him up and just carried him straight out the front door. All right. And Officer Waddell, as this first child was being taken out, did you hear the defendant make any inquiry about where her child was being taken to? No. 
Did you hear her say anything at all concerning this first child as the paramedic is taking him out the front door? No. Did she make any attempt whatsoever to follow the paramedic out as he took this first child out of the house? No. What's the next thing that happened after the first child was taken out of the house then? Well, this paramedic came around and told me that there was nothing he could do for that child over there. At that time, Lieutenant Walling came back inside the house and we went and checked upstairs. Okay. Did you go up these stairs here? Yes, sir. Okay. Are there a number of rooms upstairs in this house? Yes, sir. Do you recall the rooms that you all went into that morning? I believe there were four rooms, at least four rooms. Did you check each of the rooms? Yes. Did you find any other victims upstairs? No. Did you find any other persons upstairs? Yes. Okay. And who did you find upstairs? An eight-month-old baby. And do you recall where you found him? In a baby bed in the master bedroom. All right. Now, when you went upstairs, officer, had... Did you know that a baby was upstairs? No. Had the defendant said anything to you or anyone else in your presence about a baby being upstairs before you and Lieutenant Walling went up there to find him? No. How was the baby when you went up there? He was fine, standing up in the bed, just looking over the rail. Appeared to be in good shape? Yes, sir. Okay. Appeared to be in any sort of danger? No. When you and Lieutenant Walling got to that baby, had you checked all the other rooms upstairs yet? No, sir. Did you take the baby with you then? No. Okay, why didn't you take the baby out of the bassinet and take him with you? We still hadn't located the suspect and didn't know if he was in one of the upstairs rooms. All right, so did you, in fact, then complete your check of the upstairs rooms? Yes. Did you find anything unusual upstairs then besides the baby being in the bassinet? No. Okay, What did you and Lieutenant Walling do after you finished upstairs? We went back downstairs and Lieutenant Walling went outside. He went outside. Where did you go to? I went to the entranceway right in this hallway here. All right. Let me just ask you whether or not you saw anyone as you're coming down the stairs. Just tell members of the jury whether or not you saw anyone as you were coming down the stairs that morning. Yes, I did. And who was that? It was one of the neighbors. Okay, where did you see her? She was in the entryway here, right in this area. Okay, if you would, if you would just put an X where you saw the person, just label it as neighbor. Was it male or female? It was female. Okay, was she running? Was she moving? What was she doing? She was just standing there. And did you go down and have a conversation with her? Yes, Did she say anything to you about why she was in the house? No. At one point, Darren Routier told me that there was a nurse that lived across the street. And I told him that if she was a nurse, that she could come over, that we did need some help. All right. At that time, had the paramedics got there yet? At the time I found her? No. At the time that you had that conversation with Darren? Oh, no, sir. No. At the time that you saw saw this woman in the entryway. The paramedics were already there, though. Right? Right. Did you have a conversation with her? Yes. And what was the conversation that you had with this woman? I told her that the paramedics had already taken care of the... One child was already out in the ambulance, and the defendant was sitting on the front porch, and they were attending to her wounds. Okay. So did this woman remain in the house? Did she go anywhere else in the house with you, or what did she do? No, I instructed her that we didn't need her at that time, and that she needed to leave the house. Did she leave the house? Yes. Okay. About how long did that conversation take place uh, before she left the house, if you recall? Less than a minute. Did you actually see her leave the house then? Yes. Okay, and... Did I understand you to say that the defendant was already out on the front porch? Yes. At the time that the neighbor left the house, Officer Waddell, then besides yourself and Lieutenant Walling, who else was still inside that house? I believe there were a couple more paramedics inside. 
Okay, and the first child had already been taken out, correct? Yes. How about the second child? Had he been taken out yet? No. So he's in there with a couple of paramedics, perhaps. Right. You're in there still. I'm still in the house. All right. And did you say that Lieutenant Walling stayed in the house or did he leave and go outside? He went outside. What did you do then? Once this neighbor left, what did you do? I went to the front door and waited for the paramedics to come out and they told me that there was nothing more they could do for the second child. And they told me they were going to get their stuff and I noticed one of them was carrying the baby downstairs and they were all going outside. Okay, what was the purpose of you then staying at this front door? To secure the crime scene. Can you give us an approximate time when the paramedics left and you were posted here at the front door, just an approximation, if you recall? About 2.40 or 2.45. Are you looking at your watch? during that period of time? No. So that would just be an approximation. Yes, sir. And once you were posted here at this door, how long did you remain here at the front door? Until probably a little after 3 a.m. Officer Waddell, did anyone enter that house after you between the 2 o'clock or 2.45 that you were posted at this front door until you left the door sometime after 3 a.m.? Did anyone at all enter that residence, sir? No. When you were at the store, could you still see Lieutenant Walling? Yes. Could you see what he was doing? Yes. And what did you see Lieutenant Walling doing? He was stringing up crime scene tape across the street. And is that the yellow tape that y'all used? Yes, sir. Did you actually watch him do that? Yes, sir. Officer Waddell, if you would just step right here for a moment. Whereupon the witness stepped down from the witness stand and approached the jury rail and the proceedings were resumed as follows. I believe you've you've previously looked at photographs marked States Exhibits 11, 11-A, 11-B, 11-C, D, E, and F. Have you not? Yes, sir. First of all, state's exhibit number 11. Is that an accurate portrayal of the floor plan of the family room as it appeared on June the 6th of 1996? Yes, it is. Does it accurately locate the two boys that you saw that evening? Yes. State's exhibits 11-A through 11-F. Do they truly and accurately depict the family room of 5801 Eagle Drive as it appeared on June the 6th, 1996? At this point, Mr. Mulder says, Judge, we would like the record to reflect that he's showing the photograph to the jury while he's apparently attempting to identify it. Mr. Greg Davis then says, well, I would like for the record to reflect that I have just two hands. I'm making my best efforts not to have the jury see the photographs. The court then says, gentlemen, gentlemen, I will make the rulings overruled, continue. Mr. Greg Davis then says, thank you. Mr. Greg Davis then continues the questioning. Do they truly and accurately depict the family room as it appeared that morning? Yes, sir. Your honor, at this time we'll offer state's exhibits 11, 11 11-A, 11-B, 11-C, 11-D, 11-E, and 11-F. The court then asks, any objection? Mr. Mulder says, we'd like to see it, Judge. We weren't in the jury box and weren't able to see them. Mr. Davis then says, these, all exhibits have previously been inspected by the defense prior to trial, Your Honor. The court then says, the court is aware of that. Mr. Mulder then says, I don't know the numbers on them. The court then says, well, take a look. Mr. Mulder says, we have no objection. The court then says the state's exhibits are admitted. Mr. Davis then continues. All right, Officer Waddell, is state's exhibit 11, is that a floor plan of this family room again? Yes. And we've got two pictures. The first picture up here toward the top portion of that floor plan, is that the second child? Yes. The other child, would that be the smaller child that you have referred to? Yes. Can you tell the members of the jury what we see here in State's Exhibit 11-A? 
that's the entrance into the family room that would be looking from this hallway here. And what's this object I'm pointing to here at the top right-hand portion of the photograph? The telephone that she was talking on. The red area on the carpet. What is that? Blood. Okay. Do you see another object, a rectangular object close to that phone? What is that? I believe that's the plastic runner that was over the carpet. Now, if we could, if we could, can everyone see that? If we could, could we look at States Exhibit 11-B and just take us through that photograph, if you would, and show the members of the jury what we see in that photograph? Okay, this is, what are we looking at? What direction are we looking? This is the family room. You'd be looking from the entrance. The entrance to the family room is over here. This is where the second child was. The first one would have been over here in this area somewhere. All right. Do we see the couches in that photograph? Yes, sir. Do we see the telephone again? I don't see it. No. Okay. If you would, if you'll look at the right portion of that photograph. Oh, over here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's the telephone. All right. And what is the object next to that telephone on the floor, if you know? A rag. Okay. Do you recall that morning what type of rag that the defendant had around her neck when you saw her? It was green. It was greenish colored rag. The color of the rag in this photograph. Can you tell the color there? Green. All right. Toward the right portion of the... Let me just step around here so I can ask you a question here. This white area here, what is that? That's the end of the counter. To the right, would that be the kitchen then? Yes, sir. Okay, there's an object up here, officer, a white object. What is that? I would have to look. I can't see it from here. Okay, that's the knife. Okay, did you see that knife that morning? Yes, I did. Was it in that same position when you first saw it? Yes, sir. If you... Now, if we'll look at State's Exhibit 11-C, D, E, and F, who do those photographs show? That's the second child. That would be the one located over here in this portion of the room. Is that right? Yes, sir. When you first saw the child that morning, was he covered with this object? No. Do you know how that got on him? I believe one of the paramedics put it over him. Okay. When you first saw the child, do you recall whether or not was he lying down? Yes, he was. Was he on his back or was he on his stomach? On his back. Okay. Would it be more in the position that we see here in States Exhibit number 11-D and 11-E then as far as being on his back? Yes, sir. Looking at States Exhibit 11-F, can you tell whether or not the child's eyes are open in this photograph or not? Yes, they look open to me. Those other objects, there appears to be a pillow over there near him. Is that correct? Yes. Do we also see that same pillow up here in this photograph 11-B? Yes, sir. Do you know what these items are over here? We see in States Exhibit 11-C. Do you know what those items were up here towards the top portion of the photograph? No, sir, I don't. Did you ever examine them yourself? No, sir. Look through those in any way? No, sir. Okay, thank you. You may retake your seat. Whereupon the witness resumed, the witness stand and the proceedings were resumed on the record. Mr. Greg Davis then continues, again, he's the prosecutor, to question Officer Waddell. Officer Waddell, uh, let me pick it up again where you're at the front door. You stayed there until sometime after three o'clock. When did you leave the front door? When Officer Wade relieved me from the front door. Okay. What's his full name, if you know? Steve Wade. All right. And do you recall about what time he got to the front door? It was right around 3 a.m., and he was there to relieve you. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Did you then leave the front door? Yes, sir. All right. Did you go with anyone or did you leave by yourself? I left the front door by myself, but I met someone else. All right. Who did you meet? A Garland canine officer. Do you remember what his name was? Uh, Griffith or Griffin? 
Okay. Did he have a dog with him? Yes. And did you stay at the residence with the officer and his dog, or did you go someplace? We went somewhere. And as best you recall, can you tell the members of the jury where you went with Officer Griffith and the dog? We walked around the neighborhood. We walked up and down the alleys across front yards. We went to about two or three streets behind 5801 Eagle. How long did you go with Officer Griffith through the neighborhood? We were out there for about 50 minutes. During the time that you were with the officer and his dog, did you ever locate any suspects? No. Did you arrest anybody? No, sir. Find anything that you took back to the residence? No, sir. Did you actually go back to 5801 Eagle Drive? Yes, sir. And when you got back, were you instructed to do anything? Yes. And what did you do in response to your instructions? I followed my instructions and I went to the back of the house. All right. And is there an alley that runs behind the house? Yes, sir. What did you do once you got back there? I was assigned to stay in the alley and stop anybody who came down the alley and identify them and ask them if they had heard anything that was out of the ordinary for that night. That morning, do you recall how long that you stayed in the alley? Probably till about seven or eight in the morning. How many cars did you stop while you were in the alley? One. About what time did you stop the vehicle? It was right before the sun came up. And how many people were inside the car? One. Can you describe the person that was inside the car? It was a white female. And did you determine where she was going? Yes, sir. And where was that? She said she was going to work. Did you detain her back there or did you let her go to work? I let her go to work. Anybody else? Did you come in contact with anybody else back there in that alley before you left it? No, sir. Other than the police officers, no. How long did you remain there at that location in the morning? I was there till about 7 or 8 in the morning. About 7 or 8 in the morning. Yes, sir. And once you left, where did you go to? I went back to the police station. And when you got back to the police station, what did you do? I started writing a report. Is that standard procedure? Yes. All right, and what's the purpose of you sitting down and making a report at that time? To document facts so that I can remember what happened and to supply the investigators with information to start an investigation. When you make a report, do you attempt to put down every single thing that you said or heard or saw? Well, I try to, as best you can. Yes, sir. And do you recall about what time that you left the station that morning when you finished your report? Maybe around 10 or 11 a.m. By that time, you, by the time you finished your report, how long had you been on duty? 13, 14 hours. Did you go home after that? Yes. Were you scheduled to work the next morning? I mean, the next evening. Yes. All right. So you were scheduled to work. You worked the evening of the 5th, correct? Right. We're now into about... 10 or 11 in the morning on the 6th and you were scheduled to work the evening of the 6th. Is that right? Yes. What time did you go on duty that night? 9.30. And did you actually go out on patrol again? Yes. Again by yourself? Yes. Was there ever a time when you came back to the police station before completing your patrol duties? Yes. And about what time was that? About 1 a.m. What was the purpose of you going back? Why did you do that? I had remembered some more information that I thought was important, and I thought I would do a supplement. Okay, do a supplemental report? Yes, sir. And did you, in fact, go back to the police station and do that? Yes, I did. Is it unusual to do a supplemental report? No. Do you have a form that the Rowlett Police Department uses that, in fact, says supplemental offense report? Yes, sir. And did you then complete a supplemental report that morning? Yes, I did. Mr. Greg Davis then says, okay, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Officer Waddell, I'm going to just ask you, just for identification purposes, have I showed you these pieces of paper? I believe there are actually six pieces of paper prior to your testimony. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Just to verify that these are, in fact, the reports that you prepared 
both the offense report and the supplemental offense report in this case. Is that right? Yes, sir. Your Honor, at this time, we will tender the reports to Mr. Mulder and we will pass the witness for cross-examination. And the court then says, all right, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a 10 minute break, please. Thank you. Be back about 1020. When the jury returns and the court is back in session, the cross-examination by Mr. Douglas Mulder, who is Darley's defense attorney, begins. Officer Waddell, just a thing or two. I believe you said that prior to this occasion, you had particip- participated in one homicide. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. And that's in your four and a half years or four years and some change as a police officer. Yes, sir. All right. Now, you told us that you were in the church parking lot. Yes, sir. And that was on Highway 66. Yes, sir. A mile and nine tenths from this location. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And what was your unit number at that time? 82. 82. And Sergeant Walling then would have been 84. Is that fair to say? No, sir. Who was 84? I believe that was Officer Moore. I'm not for sure. All right. Was Sergeant Walling, was your sergeant at that time? Was he not? Yes, sir. All right. And he was on duty at that time. Yes. And was responded to the same call that you did. Did he not? Yes. Okay. And do you know where he was at the time that he responded? No. Okay. Could you tell us, tell the jury, please, sir, where the 5,000 block of Highway 66 is? The 5,000 block, I believe it's at Liberty Grove and Highway 66, which was across the lake from where I was. All right. Approximately how far would that be in miles? Do you know from the 5,000 block to the house? Well, you said the church was on Highway 66. Yes, sir. Can you see Highway 66 on this exhibit? Yes. It's the red road right here, isn't it? Yes, sir. And where were you? Could you tell us just approximately? Right in here on that, just on that side of the lake. Okay. And about what is your best estimate as to how long you were there at the residence, the Routier's residence, before your sergeant got there? Maybe five or six minutes. Okay. You, just so that you and I are on the same wavelength here, you have testified under oath in a hearing prior to today. Have you not? Yes, sir. Okay. And is it not fair to say that at that hearing, you estimated the time as little as two minutes? Not that I recall. No. Okay. And would you like to have me show that to you so that would that refresh your memory? Do you think? Yes, sir. Now, if my memory serves me, I believe you testified two, three, or four minutes, but never five or six. Is that right? I don't have, I don't know what it was. I would have to see it. Did you review that for your testimony here today? No, sir. You did not? No, sir. Why is that? I just didn't read it. Your purpose in being here is to testify as accurately as you can, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay, and be as truthful as you can? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you recall being asked, quote, you were there first. Walling arrived in about three or four minutes. Is that correct? To which you answered, I I guess I'm not sure how long it took him. I assumed it was two, three, or four minutes. Does that sound about right? Yes, sir. I don't want to split hairs with you, but I want to. I have got to. I have this for a purpose. Okay? Yes, sir. Do you recall how long it took you to respond? Two to three minutes. Okay. And you were some 1.9 miles away. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And of course you drove quickly, I assume, in response to that emergency. Did you not? Yes, sir. And I believe you said that you used your emergency lights, your emergency lights. Did you not? Yes, sir. Okay. I wrote down, you were asked by the prosecutor how long you were there, and you answered that, and you told him that you were posted, I assume, by Sergeant Walling at the door to secure the premises. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. All right. And do you recall, I wrote it down when you, the time that you said, you said it was about 2.40 to 2.45 that you were posted. 
That was an estimate. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you recall whether the ambulance got there before Sergeant Walling got there or after Sergeant Walling got there or at the same time that Sergeant Walling got there? I think it was the same time. Okay, so Walling arrived at the same time as the ambulance. Yes, sir. Okay, and Waddell's response time was two to three minutes, right? Yes, sir. Okay, you have listened to the 911 tape in preparation for your testimony, have you not? I have. Okay. And have you listened to it more than once? No, just listened to it one time. I believe just one time. Okay. And you've talked to the prosecutors, nothing wrong with that, but you've talked to the prosecutors on a number of occasions. Have you not? Yes, I have. Do you have any estimate as to how many times you've gone over your testimony with them? Maybe two, maybe two times, two or three. Did you ever participate in a mock trial with them? We had a meeting. Yes. Okay. You call that a meeting? Yes, sir. Where you got up on the witness stand and everybody told their story? Yes, sir. You did that? Yes. How long ago was that? Maybe three weeks. I'm not really for sure. Okay. Did they critique you after that? I mean, did they tell you how you did and tell you where you can improve and things of that nature? They told me I did all right. Okay, nothing wrong with that. At that time, did you hear the 911 tape? No. Okay, did you hear other officers testify? I heard some, yes. Okay, so you did your part in it. And you did it in a... Did you do it in a courtroom or up in the DA's office? Or where did you do it? It was up in the courtroom. In a courtroom? Yes, sir. Okay, it wasn't the district attorney's office? No. Okay, but you got on the witness stand just like you are there. Yes. And went through the same thing that you've gone through for the folks here. Yes. Kind of a dress rehearsal, I guess. Yes. Okay. And now when you, did you talk to the prosecutor last night? No. Did you talk to him this morning? Yes, I did. Did you go over these photographs with him this morning? No, you didn't. No. When did you go over these photographs with the prosecutor? The last time I met with him, which I don't remember what time that was, but it was within the last week. All right. What I'll, I'll call this quote, secured residence at 240 to 245, right? That's probably pretty close. All right. And part of your business is knowing what time it is and what time things are going on. Isn't that right? At certain times, but it's not my business to look at my watch all the time. No, but you wear a watch. That's one of your requirements, isn't it? No, sir, it's not a requirement. Then they say, don't wear a watch. They don't tell me I have to wear a watch. Okay, do you know a police officer that doesn't wear a watch? I don't wear mine sometimes. Okay, were you wearing it that night? Yes. Okay, so we can assume that these times are reasonably accurate. Is that right? I didn't look at my watch to get those times, no. Okay, I guess when you got there to the scene, Officer Waddell, it was something like, I mean, something like you had never seen before and you were understandably overcome by it, I would guess. I wouldn't say I was overcome by it, but it's not something that I had seen before, though. All right, and you've just seen one single homicide prior to that. I guess. Well, I've seen more. I've worked one. Okay. You walk in and you, incidentally, on the 911 tape, do you hear your voice? I didn't hear it. Did you see where you're, did you see a transcript of the 911 tape? I saw portions of one, yes. Why is it you just saw portions? I just saw portions of it. Any reason that you just saw a portion of it as opposed to the whole thing? No. Was the whole 911 tape available to you? I don't know how long the 911 tape is. I listened to portions of it. I don't know if there was more to it or not. What were, what were you, where were you when you listened to portions of it? In here? In where? In this room? In this room? Yes, sir. When was that? Sunday? Okay. So you had a dress rehearsal up in Dallas and another one down here. No, sir. 
but you came in here and listened to the 911 tape. Yes, sir. Okay, was who else was present at the time? Myself and Sergeant Walling and a couple more police officers and people with the Dallas County DA's office. Who were the other police officers and who were there? Sergeant Ward, Sergeant Walling, Steve Ferry, Steve Wade, and there's probably a couple more I don't remember. Everybody that you were sworn in with the other day, they were all here? I believe so, yeah. Okay, and did you discuss your testimony at that time? We went over it, yes. Well, I mean, that's the whole purpose in getting together, to kind of go over everybody's testimony. Yes. So you understood what Walling was going to say, and Walling understood what you were going to say, and Ward understood what Walling and Waddell were going to say, and everybody just, no, sir, that was not the reason. But that was all done, and you were present when I was in the same room, yes, yes. The reason for me to do it was to go over my testimony. You, all right. Now, just so I'm clear, you had gone over with it a number of times up in Dallas. Had you not? A couple. Well, and you had a hearing where you were under oath, just like you are now. You appreciate that, don't you? Yes, sir. Okay. And then you had the dress rehearsal up in Dallas, right? Yes, sir. And then you met down here. And did you go over the entire 911 tape? I don't know if I went over the whole tape or not. We went over part of it. I don't know. Do you know about how long it was on? No, sir. All right. Is it fair to say that this, and I'm going to get into this in a minute, but is it fair to say that the conversations that you told us about in this room here with Darley Routier, all of those conversations occurred prior to Sergeant Walling's arrival. Yes, no question about that, is there? Well, as far as I can recall, everything that me and her talked about was before he got there. Okay, no question about that, at least where we stand right now. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Okay, is that right? Quote, all conversations with Darley prior to Walling's arrival. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Mulder, uh, Darley's defense attorney, then says, when the time comes, I'll offer that into evidence, judge. And the court says, I understand, and then asks, can all of the members of the jury see that? One juror says, not really. The court then says, I don't think the last two can see it. Mr. Mulder then says, well, I don't think there is anything important at the time on that right now. So, and then he continues questioning uh, Officer Waddell. Now, Officer Waddell, you said that you're trained and you had a gun that night, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you're trained as a member of the SWAT team. Is that right? It's a special operation response team. Okay. And you said they serve search warrants and things of that nature. Yes, sir. Okay. And you've also had other training that you've told us about. Yes, sir. And you told us that the three things that a police officer does when he arrives at a situation like that... The first thing he does is secure the scene. You need to find out where the suspect is first. Okay, well, you know, I would think, and all I know about this is what I see on TV, but what I would think, and then Mr. Greg Davis, the prosecutor, pipes up and says, I'm sorry, I'm going to object to this. I don't know what that is. Sidebar. Mr. Mulder then says, well, it was a question. And the court then says, gentlemen, all right, let's just ask straight questions and not discuss personal questions antidotes. Thank you. Mr. Mulder then says, well, I would think that the first thing you would be concerned with would be to find out if the suspect was present. Is that right? Yes, sir. Did you do that? Yes, sir. Okay. That's the very first thing you did when you walked in. That's the first thing I asked. Yes. All right. And that's the first thing you asked of her, right? Okay. And you said at the time that she was on the telephone. Yes, sir. All right. Do you know to whom she was speaking at that time? Well, I assumed it was the 911 dispatchers. Well, now, why would you assume that it was the 911 dispatcher? Because I knew that she called over 911 to report the stabbing. Okay. Matter of fact, 911 is trained to keep the caller on the phone until the police arrive, aren't they? I don't know. I've not been trained to do that. Well, I understand you're not a 911 operator, but... Doesn't that make sense to you? And hasn't that been your experience that 911 keeps the caller on the phone until the police arrive? 
in most circumstances they do. Well, that's what they're trained to do, aren't they? I don't know if they're trained to do that. All right. And another thing that 911 is trained to do is to tell the caller not to touch the evidence, aren't they? I don't know. Well, don't you, as a police officer, tell people when you go in, quote, don't touch anything? I've been trained to do that. And why is that? Because you need to preserve the crime scene. And it's because people naturally touch things, don't they? Yes, sir. All right. There's nothing difficult about that. It's human nature. Cops do the same thing. You've seen them do it, haven't you? They walk in, they pick up the gun, or they pick up the knife, or they pick up some of the evidence, don't they? I've seen it. And that's why you even preserve it. Police officers do that, don't they? I've seen it done. You've seen them pick it up and then they put it right back when they realize what they've done. I've seen that. Yes, sir. That's not unusual, is it? I've seen it a couple of times. All right. Now, the first thing you asked her was, where is the suspect? I tried to get a description of him. Where is the guy that did this? What exactly did you say to her? I asked her for a description of him and who had done it. All right. And she said, she pointed and said, he's in the garage. She said the guy was in the garage. All right. And what did that mean to you? That meant he was in the garage. All right. Well, you had a gun with you, didn't you? Yes, I did. And I would think that after you find out who he is and where he is, I would think that the first thing you would do once you found out where he was and this is a relatively short space from here, I suspect to the utility room door, it's no more than from here to that door, is it? It's probably pretty close. Okay, so we're not talking about a huge room, are we? No. I would think that the first thing that you would do is draw your gun if you thought somebody was a dangerous person was in the garage and proceed to the garage to secure the area. I mean, you don't want him to come out with a gun. First of all, you didn't know how many people were in there, did you? That's right. You didn't know whether there was one assailant or two assailants or three assailants, did you? Well, she told me there was one. She told you she she saw one? Right. Does that always mean that there's just one? No. All right. I would think you take your gun out and hot foot it in here to take a look and make sure there isn't somebody there with a gun who's going to come out and kill you and everyone else. My gun was out. I didn't go into the garage then. Why not? I didn't need to. I didn't need to go into the garage at the time. The garage door was closed and I didn't know who was in there. Well, I mean, that's why you would go into the garage to find out who was in there, right? And if I go in there and he kills me and there's nobody to protect them, So you thought you could, you had your gun out and you were kind of covering the area from back here, some 20 feet away. Is that it? After I went into the kitchen and looked into the garage, tried to look into the garage. Well, I mean, if the door, the door to the garage was closed or the door to the utility room was closed, the utility room door was open and the door going into the garage was closed. Okay. And did you walk along here, along this island to get in there? Yes. And there was some broken glass along there, wasn't there? Yes. Did you step in the glass? No. How do you know you didn't step in the glass? I saw the glass on the floor and I stepped over it. Okay, there were just a few pieces of broken glass. I remember seeing one wine glass that was broken. That's what I remember seeing. Okay, I mean, the glasses that I've seen that break don't just break into a couple of pieces. Was there something unusual about this wine glass? No. I mean, did it break into many pieces or just a couple of pieces? I remember seeing broken glass. I don't know how many pieces were on the floor. Okay. And you kind of tiptoed through the, no, you just walked straight through it. I stepped over it. All right. Okay. And how far did you proceed to where you could look And you could see that the garage door was closed, probably to the end of the island in the kitchen. Okay. Now, when you walked into the room, well, strike that. After you had looked and you saw that the garage door was closed, you came on back. Did you? Yes. That couldn't have taken a great deal of time, I suspect. No. Okay. And did you ever tell Darlie to sit down? 
Yes. Okay. And where was that in the sequence of events? Was that early on? That was early on. Okay. So you told her, you asked her where the suspect was, and then you told her to sit down. Right. All right. Did she sit down? She did. Okay. All right. And was it from her sitting down position that you questioned her? Yes. Okay. And I take it that you... Now, speed is important in this type of situation, is it not? Yes. So you come in and the first thing you say to her is, where's the suspect? Where's the guy that did this? Or words to that effect. I asked her who had done it. Okay. And she points to the garage and says that he's in the garage. Yes. And at that time, did you tell her, well, tend to the kid? Yes. The child here? Yes. You did? Yes. All right. You had stepped over him on the way in, had you not? His feet. You had stepped over him. You hadn't walked around him. You stepped over him, didn't you? His feet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And so you said, quote, attend to the child and I'll look for the assailant. I told her to tend to the child. Yes. Okay. And then you went to this area right here, right? Right. And that couldn't have taken more than that long, could it? I mean, basically, it was pretty, it didn't take very long. I mean, five seconds, 10 seconds outside? Could have been. All right. And then you began to question her about what happened? I believe so. Did she stay in that seated position? No, she stood up before I went into the kitchen. She sat down for a second, then she stood back up. Oh, now she stood right back up after you. You told her to sit down and she sat down and then she sat right back up. Yes. I mean, stood right back up. Stood right up. Okay. Well, did you, well, why did you tell her to sit down? Because I saw the blood on the front of her t-shirt. I didn't know if it was coming from her or what. I know that the more she moves around, the more blood she loses. That's an absolute fact, isn't it? The more you move, the more you will bleed. Isn't that right? That's what I thought. And that's why a lot of times they'll tell someone who's been injured, who's been cut or shot or whatever to sit down or lay down, and then it slows down the bleeding, doesn't it? Yes. You are trained in first aid, are you? Yes. Okay. You could have administered help to this child, couldn't you? Not under those circumstances. Okay, just out of curiosity... What would you have done for him if you had been able to make it to the garage door and say, not just look at it, but do you know whether or not this door was locked or not? I didn't know at the time. Did you know whether it had a lock on it? I believe it did. Anything to prevent you from going in there. If in fact, you're going to take this tact that you're going to retreat behind the lines until help arrives. Anything to prevent you from locking that door me from locking it? Yeah. I don't know. I didn't attempt to do that. Well, I mean, any reason you didn't? I mean, you just didn't think of it. Well, no, I didn't want to do that. Oh, you thought of it and didn't want to, decided not to. No, I didn't think of it. That's just not something that went through my mind to go lock the door. Well, you didn't want to stick your nose out in a garage because you thought somebody with a knife or a gun might be in there, right? I didn't want to go barging in the garage, right? Okay, but you didn't think the lock would secure the... If your point was, I guess, maybe I'm missing the point, but if the idea is to secure the scene and you don't want to go into the garage until help arrives, why not just lock the garage door? I just didn't want to go that far away from them. Oh, you didn't want to leave them. What were you doing for them? Well, I didn't know if the guy was in the garage for sure or not. I knew he was still in the house. She thought he was in the garage. Well, you thought you might have to cover the living room, the entry and the dining room and the nook. Is that what you're saying? He could have been anywhere. I know, but these places were, I mean, you could just turn around, turn your head and search this area, couldn't you? I could see the kitchen, yeah. You could see there wasn't anybody in the kitchen except you, couldn't you? Right? 
But I mean, like I said, if your point was to secure the garage or secure yourself from the garage, why not just lock the door and go back and start helping everybody? I just didn't do it. All right. But so it's your story, Officer Waddell, that the first thing you saw Darley and asked where the assailant was and you checked to see if the garage door was closed and then you went back and began questioning her. I didn't go back and question her. I told her to help her boy. You told her to help her boy and your story is she didn't. Right. And you didn't. Right. And Darren had his hands full with the other child. Right. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So what did you do then? She began to tell me how she got into a fight with him at the end of the bar. Okay, and is she still on the phone? I'm not sure at what point when she put the phone down. I don't know if she was or not. Okay, but is this fair to say that this would have been within 30 seconds of the time that you entered? It's probably close. Close? Yes. Let's say within 30 seconds of Waddell's entry... He begins to, do we say question or do we say, let's just say obtain information regarding call. Is that fair to say? I believe I said that she began to tell me about the assault. Well, doesn't that? All right. Darley began telling of assault. Again, all conversations with Darley are prior to Walling's arrival. Yes, sir. Okay. Waddell doesn't know if Darley is still on the phone. Fair enough? Yes, sir. Okay, so are you taking notes at this time? Mm Mm-hmm. No, not taking any notes. No. Don't you carry a whip-out book? Yes. Did you have your... uh, Tell the jury what you... Do you have a whip-out book with you? I do. Would you show them what a whip-out book is? A whip-out book is just a little... Can you show them? Take it out of your pocket and show them. No. Oh, you don't have it? I have a whip-out book, but it's... You left it in the car? Well, no, I have it with me. With you right there? Yes, sir. Well, just show them. Well, it's a small little... If there's some reason you don't want to show them your whip-out book? Well, there's nothing in my whip-out book that needs... It's irrelevant to this case. Well, I'm not going to ask you to read it to them. I just asked, is there some reason you don't want to show them that is just a little spiral book, isn't it? Well, there's another thing we were taught to also is just never show anybody your whip out book. No, never show a defense attorney. Okay, I'll tell you, I won't look. If you'll just show the jury what a whip out book is, a small no, no, just take yours out and show it to them, Officer Waddell, and I won't look. Okay. And then the w- witness complies. Now, you had that book with you. That wasn't so hard, was it? I had a book with me. Yes, sir. All right. Not that one? Right. Right. But now you're talking to her and she's giving you information of the assault, right? And you don't take any notes. Not at that time. I've got my gun in one hand and I'm trying to talk on the police radio too and call for help. Oh, now you've got a radio in the other hand. Off and on, I've got it in a holder, okay? And every once in a while, I have to pick it up and tell them, send reinforcements? I called for, I told them we needed an ambulance and we needed crime scene personnel and that I needed some more help out here. All right. Okay. So you made that call. And as a matter of fact, the first notes that you made were when you got back to the station, weren't they? Well, is that fair to say? I believe that's fair to say, isn't it? No, I believe I made some before then. Oh, you believe you did? Yes, sir. Is that a kind of a definite maybe? Well, I did make some before then. Oh, so you you did make some notes. Do you still have those notes? I don't have them, no. Okay, do you know where they are? No, sir, I don't. Don't know where they are? No, sir. Did you make those notes in one of these whip-out books? Yes, but not that one. 
not this one. So you've lost the notes. No, I just don't know where they are. I don't have them with me. I believe a copy was given to Sergeant Walling. Okay, so what we're relying on now is what you can retrieve, I take it, from the halls of your memory. Yes. Okay, and you're telling us now that within 30 seconds of Waddell's entry, he, Darley, began telling of the assault. And I need to add in here, Waddell looked at the garage door, but didn't think to check if it was locked. Was that your... I didn't check it, no. You said you didn't think to check. Yeah. Okay. Turned out it wasn't locked, was it? I'm sorry. It was not locked, was it? I don't think it was. You know it wasn't, don't you? I didn't open it. I don't know if it was locked or not. Well, weren't you with Sergeant Walling when he opened it? I was behind him, yes. Well, I mean, couldn't you tell whether it was locked or not when he opened it? I don't know what type of lock was even on it. If it had a push-button lock, then it opened and it unlocked when you turned the knob. I don't know what kind it had on it. Okay, did you see blood on the door to the garage? I didn't see any. All right. Are you saying there was no blood? No, I'm saying I didn't see any. Okay, well, a trained eye like yours would have seen blood had it been on the door, wouldn't you? Isn't that fair to say? Not necessarily. Okay, you're not trained to look for blood? At that time, I'm looking for a suspect. All right, did you see any blood in the utility room? I don't recall seeing any. All right. Now, you talked with you talked with Darley and got the information that you've told the prosecutor about. Is that right? Yes and didn't enter it into your notes at that time. I'm not fussing with you. I just, is that right? Mr. Greg Davis then says, I'm sorry, I'm going to object to all these sidebars about him not fussing or whatever he's doing. The court then says, I think he's just commenting. Mr. Mulder, the defense attorney, says, I'm just trying to coax an answer from him. I'm just, I'm just. The court then says, I understand. Mr. Greg Davis, the prosecutor says, just ask the questions and let him give the answers. The court then says, gentlemen, please, let's stop the bickering back and forth. Just ask the questions. I think Mr. Mulder was just asking a question. Let's go on. Mr. Mulder then says, I asked the question. Would you ask him to answer? The witness then says, what's your question? The court says, re-ask the question. And then Mr. Mulder says, I said, at this time, you didn't make any notes in your book at the time then. And you explained that you had your hands full with a radio in one hand, calling for help from time to time. And you had your gun out in the other hand in case the assailant came from the garage. Right. Okay. So you didn't make any notes at that time, did you? No. Okay. And how long did you continue to question her there? For a long time or a short time or... The only questions I asked her was if she had a description of the suspect and who would have done it. And that's all you asked her. Fair enough? All that I can remember right now, asking her. But we don't know where the book is and we're relying on your memory, aren't we? Yes. All right. As a matter of fact, she told you she didn't know whether the suspect was white or black, didn't she? Yes, at one point she did. Okay. Now, did you talk to her? Or question Darren Routier at that time? No, I asked him if he knew who would have done something like that. Okay, and how long did you talk to him? I just asked him that question from across the room, and that was about it. When you put up your... Well, what would you have done for that child at that time? The only thing I know to do would have been to apply pressure to his wounds to try and stop the bleeding. Okay, and... How would you have done that? With a towel or something. With a towel. And it's your story here today that you asked her to get a rag. Is that right? Yes. A rag or a towel? I think I asked her to get a towel. You think you asked her to get a towel. Okay. And she didn't do it. No. Okay. Walling got there about that time? Pretty close. Was she standing up or sitting down when Walling arrived? I believe she was standing up. Okay. And then you told her to sit down again? Yes. 
Okay, when she stood up, did you tell her to sit back down? I believe I did. Okay, so you, it's your story. I want to make sure I get this straight now. It's your story that she was standing here. You told her to sit down. She was standing in this area. You told her to sit down and she sat down and you ran up here and back, right? I didn't run up there. Did you? I walked up there. Well, all right. I walked slow or fast or, well, I didn't walk real fast because I was trying to look as I went. Okay, but it was a well-lit area though, wasn't it? Right. I mean, you were trying to avoid the glass as you went. I saw the glass as I was looking. I didn't know if there was anybody hiding on the other side of the island. I was looking for a suspect anywhere. Okay, and you didn't see anything. You were asked, I think if you saw, let me see. Were you asked if you saw anything in here that would have impeded your walk between this den area and the sink? Were you asked that? Today, I don't think so. No, at one point. At one point I was. And you said that there was nothing that would have impeded your walk here. No, that's not what I said. Okay, let me see if I can find out what you said. You were asked if there were any... You've seen the photographs since then, haven't you? In your preparation, you've seen a vacuum cleaner on the floor, haven't you? Yes. Now, were you asked, were there any large objects lying on the floor? And did you answer, quote, I didn't see any unquote, talking about the kitchen. Yes. Did you answer that? That sounds right. Yes. Okay. Nothing you could trip over if you were walking to the sink and you said you didn't see any. Is that right? Well, I didn't see anything. All right. So you didn't see a vacuum cleaner at that time. You didn't see any vacuum cleaner at the time you're talking about now in this area. Did you? No. Okay. Now, like you just told the jury, You were concerned with the other side of the island there. This is the island you're talking about? Yes, sir. That somebody might have been there. And it could have perhaps endangered your life or the lives of the people there, right? Yes, sir. Okay, is that fair? I tried to write down exactly what you said. I can't read all of it. Okay. Is that, quote, did not see, question mark? Mm Mm-hmm. That's D and N. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Okay, did you go into the bathroom? At one point I did. Okay, what was your purpose in going in there? That's when we were checking the house. Okay, and you wanted to check and see if anybody was in there. Yes. Did you examine the bathroom sink? I didn't, no. Did you just eyeball it to see if anybody had run any water in it or anything like that? I just scanned over the bathroom. Did you look at the sink or not? I didn't pay any particular attention to the sink. No. Okay, all right. Now, Officer Waddell, was Sergeant Walling there when you had a conversation with Darren about the nurse across the street? No. That was before Sergeant Walling had arrived? Yes. But Darren was there in the den or in this room with you and Darley when Sergeant Walling arrived. Was he? I think he was. At any rate, the conversation that you had with Darren, was it in the family room when you asked about help? I don't recall where we were. I just remember him saying that a nurse lived across the street. Yeah, but it was chaotic, wasn't it? I mean, is it fair to say? Somewhat. Not somewhat. It was chaotic, wasn't it? Well, what do you mean by chaotic? Well, I mean, you had a woman who was hysterical, wasn't she? She was upset. Was she just mildly upset? She was screaming and yelling. Oh, okay. You had described her as hysterical. Do you still stick with that description? My description of hysterical is I believe she was screaming and yelling. Okay, so I mean, things were not calm like in this courtroom. No, all right. And she's yelling at you to help the child. Is she not? No, okay. Did Darren tell you to help the child? Darren was yelling a lot of stuff at me. He was yelling for me to get help. All right, and were you, in all fairness... Were you not overwhelmed by the situation and just kind of stood there? No. In all fairness, no. But you did nothing to help that child. No. All right. And you now, 
for that period of time that you asked those questions of Darley. Was Darren attempting to help the child, the child that you all have referred to as the second child? Yes. For that entire time? Yes. And in the meantime, he's yelling at you to get help? Yes. Did he tell you, quote, don't just stand there, get some help? I don't remember him saying that. Well, tell the jury what he was saying. He was yelling at me to get some help and get someone out there. Well, did he yell at you? How loud was he speaking? He was yelling at me. He was excited, wasn't he? Yes. How was he dressed? Blue jeans, no shirt, no shoes. All right. Barefooted, no shirt, and a pair of jeans on. Right. Well, how many times did he yell at you to get help? I don't know. I don't remember. Did he appear excited? He appeared to be, yes. Now, were you excited? I wasn't excited. I didn't know what you mean by, was I excited? Well, was your heart beating fast? Were you nervous? Were you scared? Yes. Okay. Now, once Officer Walling arrived, you told him briefly what happened, didn't you? Yes. He didn't question Darley, did he? No. And he didn't question Darren, did he? No. Okay. So, Walling just talked to you. Is that right? When he first came in, yes. Well, you never did see him talk to Darren or Darley, did you? I saw him talk to Darren. All right, how long? I don't know. I was out in the front yard. Okay, could you hear what was being said? No. Okay. Quote, Walling came in, talked only to Waddell, didn't talk to Darley or Darren, later talked to Darren in front yard Waddell couldn't hear. Is that fair? Well, are you saying that suggesting that Walling didn't talk to the defendant at all? No, he talked to her at one time out there. I don't know when. All right, when did he? When Walling came in. Let me make that when Walling first came in. All right, all right. And the only time that he talked to Darley, to your knowledge, was when? I know he talked to her when she was on the front porch. All right, could you hear what was being said? No. Waddell couldn't hear what was being said. Okay, fair enough. Yes. All right. And that's the only time you saw him talk to Darley, right? That's the only time I saw him. Okay. Now, Walling came in and the two of you, now by that time you've been there two or three or at the maximum of four minutes. Is that right? It could have been five or six. It was a short period of time. Closer back to the time when this happened, you said it was two or three minutes. Is there any reason that your memory has, it took me two to three minutes to get there? I understand that. And then it took, you were there for a couple or three minutes before Walling got there. Is that right? There were several minutes. I didn't have a stopwatch to look and see. I understand. Now, while Darley was on the phone and she was able to stop and contain herself and talk with you, She talked to me, yes. Okay, while she was on the phone, yes. Okay, so we should hear then, and we will hear conversations where she's directing herself to, as you rightly assume, the 911 operator and talking to you as well. Yes, and Darren's talking to you, and you're talking to her, and the dispatcher is talking to somebody. Isn't that right? Yes, okay. Are you talking to the dispatcher as well? Over my radio, yes. All right, so you've got, you know that she has at least two conversations going, right? Right. And you've got, and you're talking to the dispatcher on the radio or dispatcher. You got the gun in your hand, dispatcher on the radio like this or like this. You've got your radio on your left side. Yes, sir. Okay. You're talking to the dispatcher and you're talking to Darley and you're talking to Darren, right? The dispatcher. Is that right? Yes. Okay, the 911 operator is talking to Darley, who is also talking to you, right? Right. Did you hear that on the 911 tape? I heard some of it, yes. Okay. And does it stand to reason to you that if the 911 tape catches her, her, well, let me back up a minute. You're comfortable with this, aren't you? Yes. And when you listen to the 911 tape, do you hear Darley answering your questions? Yes. Okay, and do you also hear her respond to the 911 operator? I hear her telling me about the knife. Okay, does she volunteer information about picking up the knife? Yes, okay. Is it in response to anyone's question or direction? 
No? Okay. Let me read something to you and see if you recall this. Officer Waddell, was it pretty much your assessment after you had been there for a moment or so that the youngster that Darren was attempting to help was beyond help? Yes. And that the other little boy in all likelihood was beyond help as well. It appeared that way. Okay. You don't know what they had done prior to the time that you got there. Do you? No. You don't know whether they had attempted to administer mouth to mouth resuscitation or CPR on the kids. Do you? Not before I got there. No. Okay. As a parent yourself, this would be a traumatic event for a parent, wouldn't it? Yes. And people handle tragedy in different fashions, don't they? You know that as a police officer, don't you? Yes. Okay, now, were you there and did you hear on the phone, quote, hold on, baby, hold on, baby, hold on, and the 911 operator saying, quote, calm down, talk to me. Quote, I'm talking to my babies, they're dying. Did you hear anything like that? I recall hearing something. Hold on, honey. Hold on, hold on, hold on. She could have said that, yes. Well, she did express some concern then, apparently. Right? Okay. Quote, stabbed my babies. My babies are dying. They're dead. Oh my God, oh my God. Okay, stay on the phone with me. Did you hear that? I heard her say that, yes. Well, did you, when they played the 911 tape for you, did they, did you hear the 911 operator say, quote, stay on the phone with me? I don't doubt that she said it. I don't recall hearing it. Well, that's what they're trained to do. Well, don't you know what their training is? Right. Okay. Quote, Devin, no. Oh my God. Oh my God. Did you hear her say, quote, I'm scared. All right. Y'all look out in the garage. Look out. She said, y'all. Were there two of you there? No, sir. But she's not saying you. She's saying y'all look out in the garage. Myself and Darren were in the living room. Okay. Y'all look out in the garage. Look out in the garage. They left a knife laying on the, and the 911 operator says, quote, there's a knife. Don't touch anything. Did you hear that? I didn't hear that. And she says, I've already touched it and picked it up. Well, that sounds like it's in response to the 911 operator who tells her, don't touch anything. And she says, I already touched the knife. I picked it up. I don't know what she told her. I mean, does that make sense to you? That she touched it? Or does what make sense? Well, we've already agreed that it's human nature for people to touch evidence at the scene, isn't it? Right? And that's why the 911 officer, that's why police officers tell them, quote, don't touch anything. Yes. Isn't that what you tell people? Yes. You even put up plastic banners around there, tape around there, don't you? Yes, sir. Yellow tape that says crime scene? Yes, sir. Don't enter? Yes, sir. Well, but you heard her tell you on here, the knife. You asked her something about the knife. She says the knife was lying over there. I already picked it up. I didn't. She tells you that? I didn't ask her about the knife. Did you see the knife there? I saw the knife. Did you point to the knife there? I didn't point to it. I saw it. Are you sure you didn't point to that knife or ask her about that knife? I'm sure. But now, now, did you? Are you telling me that you did or did not hear your voice on the 911 tape? I did not hear my voice on the 911 tape. You couldn't distinguish your voice on the 911 tape? I couldn't. No. Did you try to? I tried. And that's why you listen to it? Yes. You know, oftentimes, has it been in your experience that oftentimes perhaps the person talking isn't the best one to recognize their voice? Say that again. Well, you know, a lot of times, you know, when you hear yourself on a tape recording, you say, that's not me. Have you done that? Yes. And you're just playing it back and you say, that doesn't sound like me. I mean, a lot of times we don't know what we sound like, do we? Yes, and at times we probably aren't the best ones to judge whether or not that's our voice, in fact, are we? Right? Mr. Mulder then says, Judge, do you want to recess at 11.30? I'm not finished here yet, and I don't want to. The court then says, well, I can see both sides. A minute, please. Uh, If Mr. Mosty and Mr. Douglas will come up, some exhibits were marked. 
and then they all go to lunch and recess until 1.15. And when the uh, jury comes back in and court resumed, uh, Mr. Mulder, the defense attorney, is still questioning Officer Waddell, the first officer on the scene. And he says, do you understand, Officer Waddell, that you, you're you still under oath? Yes, sir. Incidentally, have you talked with prosecutors since we recessed? I talked to them, yes. You talked to them? Yes, sir. Did you talk to them about the case? No. You just talked to them? Yes, sir. Did you talk to any of their investigators? No, sir. Okay, you just kind of passed the time of day with them. Yes, sir. All right. About how long did that take? A minute or two. Okay. Now, I believe you said when you and, I mean, was there any reason for you to talk to them after you testified here? No, sir. Did they critique your performance or anything? They told me I did good. I thought you didn't talk about the case. Well, that wasn't about the case. They just told me, made a comment. Okay, well, at any rate, we want you back in the same frame of mind as you were before the recess. Now, when your sergeant got there, when Sergeant Walling got there, y'all went back into the utility room, didn't you? Yes, sir. And you were, did you think the assailant might still be back there? I thought he could be, yes. It had only been a couple of minutes. Yes, all right. So you thought that he might still be cornered back there in the garage, is that right? I thought he could have been, yes. Okay, so I guess you had your guns drawn. Yes, sir. And the two of you went back through the utility room. Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. Into the garage. I didn't go all the way into the garage. No, Sergeant Walling did. You just, you covered the door to make sure you weren't attacked from back there. No, when he opened up the garage door, he went to the left and I looked to the right. You went in here to the right? I looked in there from the doorway. Oh, you just looked in. I just looked in. Sergeant Walling took one step in and he looked to the left and saw the window. All right, he saw a window. He saw the window with the cut screen. I mean, at that time, of course, you didn't know what he saw. Yeah, he told me. Okay, but you didn't see what he saw, I guess. I didn't see it. No. All right, did you stick your head in then and look? No, you never did look? Not at that time, I didn't. Okay, so did he, Sergeant Walling, go on into the garage? No, okay. The garage had a good bit of stuff in it, didn't it? Yes, it did. But he was able to, did he turn on the light? No, we use flashlights. You know, most garages that I've seen, I don't know about this one, but they generally have a light either on this side or on this side, and you can turn on a light in the garage. Does that have a light? I don't know if it did or not. Okay, so you just shined flashlights in there. Yes, sir. All right, now you both had a, I assume you had a bulletproof vest on, didn't you? Yes, sir. Okay, and I assume Sergeant Walling did too? I assume he did too. I mean, they're issued to you. You're supposed to wear them, aren't you? It's not mandatory. I know he has one that he usually wears. At any rate, y'all peeked into the garage and then came on back. Is that right? Yes, sir. Did you come back the same way that you went in through the kitchen? I did. How did Sergeant Walling come? I didn't see him when he left, but I think he went through the nook into the dining room and back out the front door. He came back out this way? Yes, sir. Okay. So he went in this way and he came out this way. Yes, sir. Okay. How did you exit? The same way I came in. So you went in this way and came back out this way, right? Indicating on the diagram. Yes, sir. And then rendezvoused with him in the entry of the dining room. Rendezvoused with who? Met with Sergeant Walling. No, no, no. Okay, well, I don't. Sergeant Walling comes through here. Yes, sir. All right. And what did you do then? I go back to the family room. You go back to the family room? Yes, sir. All right. And do the paramedics come in? Yes, sir. Okay. And when they come into a place, they come in in a hurry, don't they? They didn't run in. Well, were they walking fast? Not really. They just walked in. They just walked in nonchalantly. Well, from what I, 
I saw them walk from the doorway to the living, to the family room, okay? I don't know if they ran to the front door from their ambulance or not. Okay, all right. So you saw them come in, and at that time, was Darley still here? Yes. Okay, and was Darren where? I think when the paramedics came in, I told both of them to sit down by the sliding glass door. At that time, I take it you hadn't told them to go get help from the neighbor? I had already told him that. I told him that within the first minute or so of me showing up there. Well, did he go at that time and get help from the neighbor? I don't know if he did or not. Well, now, before lunch, you told us that he stayed in the area with the child until Walling got there. Yes, sir. Has something changed your mind? No, sir. It's the same. Okay. So he didn't leave then. Well, I lost sight of him at one time. Well, I mean, golly, it's a room that was smaller than this one, wasn't it? Right. Are you saying he left and went someplace? Yes. Well, now, you're supposedly guarding the safety not only of yourself, but these other people. Wasn't that the main purpose in being there? That's one of the reasons, yes. Okay, and you're saying you lost track of him. You're telling me he just wandered off. I assumed he was going across the street like he told me he was. All right. Well, did he leave or not? At one point, he did. I don't know at what point that was. Did he ever leave the house? I assume he did. Okay, did you... Incidentally, did you and... When you told him or permitted him to go get the help from the neighbor, were you all standing out here on the porch? No, sir. Were you in, let's see, in the entry back in the family room? Well, I really don't know exactly where I was. I know once I went inside the family room... The only time I left was to go to the garage with Sergeant Walling and then to take a peek before he got there. Okay, well, then we know we can deduce, can we not, that if you had this conversation with Darren, you had it. If you didn't leave until Walling got there and you still didn't leave except for the utility room where you poked your head in, then you had the conversation somewhere in this area when you were talking with Darren. Is that right? I'm telling you, I don't remember where I had the conversation with Darren. Yes, sir, I understand. But when you tell me that, once you got into the den area, you didn't leave until Sergeant Walling got there, I assume if, in fact, you had the conversation with Darren, you you say you did, you had it here. Am I missing something? Not necessarily. All right, did you not tell me that once you got into the family room, the kitchen area, that you didn't leave? Right. I mean, did you leave? No. The only time I left was to go into the kitchen by the island. Then I peeked in the garage. I came back and left when Sergeant Walling got there. All right. Now, we talked about Darren yelling at you to get help, haven't we? Yes, sir. Okay. And you remember that now? Yes, sir. All right. Was it after he yelled at you to get help that you yelled back at him to get help? It could have been. I don't remember the exact time that I told him if a nurse was across the street to go get her. Were you in the family room or the kitchen when you had that conversation, to the best of your knowledge? I don't remember. Were you in one room or the other? I don't recall. But we can't, can we at least be satisfied that you weren't outside when you had this conversation? I'm pretty sure I wasn't outside. Okay, and was that the conversation before Sergeant Walling arrived? Yes, sir. Okay, the conversation with Darren regarding the nurse was before Sergeant Walling arrived. Fair to say? I think it was. Okay, did the nurse come back with Darren? I remember the nurse being there. I don't know if she came... She didn't come back with Darren. Do you know if she came... Did Darren come back into the residence? Yes. And how long was he gone, as best you can recall? Not very long. I don't know. Minutes or whatever. Just a few. Okay, do you know if Darren left before or after Walling arrived? I believe it could have been before. You believe it could have been before? Yes, sir. Do you really know one way or the other? I'm not for sure, no. You don't... There was a lot going on, wasn't there? There was a lot going on. Okay, and of course you didn't take many notes, any notes, did you, at that point? No, not at that minute, no. Okay, is it fair to say that up to that point that Sergeant Walling arrived, you hadn't taken any notes, had you? No. Okay, all right. Well, Sergeant Walling arrived, and the first thing you did, 
I assume, was brief Sergeant Walling on what to expect or what the dangers were. I told him about the suspect being in the garage, yes. Okay, so y'all went to the garage. How long did that take? Not very long. Are you talking about seconds? Probably. Okay. The point was that Walling wanted to make sure the scene was secure before the paramedics entered. Wasn't that the purpose? Yes. And the paramedics are out here in a holding pattern, and the idea is to get them in to render aid just as quickly as possible. Is that right? Yes. So we're talking about a matter of seconds. And that's why once Walling got in, assessed the situation, cleared the garage, he split through the dining room because it was the quickest way to get to the entry and out to the paramedics, wasn't it? I guess it was. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. And just as soon as you went back in here and just as soon as he left, the paramedics came in like that, didn't they? The two of them. Very soon after. Yes. Okay. We're talking about seconds, aren't we? Yes, sir. All right. Did you and Walling then search the outside area? No. Did Walling search the outside area? I guess he did. I wasn't with him. Okay. Once the paramedics came in, did you then station yourself at the entry? When they first came in? No. Did you help them or assist them? I was I was in there with the defendant and her husband. Okay, but we've already been through that. We know that you didn't question her anymore or talk to her anymore after Sergeant Walling arrived, but you were standing in the same room with her. Yes, sir. Okay. Did you then leave her and station yourself at the door? No, sir. Okay. You had said earlier that you were at the door as best as you recall at what time? I said approximately 2.40 or 2.45. 2.40 to 2.45. Okay. And how long did you station yourself at that door? Until a little bit after three o'clock. Okay. And where did you go then? Around to the back. And was that with Officer Craig? I'm sorry. When he, after I left the door, I went with Officer Griffith, the canine officer. Okay. And you went around in back and went wherever you went with the canine officer. Yes, sir. He was from Garland PD. Yes, sir. And now at the time that you were stationed at the door, is it your testimony that no one, no civilian entered the premises? Yes, sir. Okay. And certainly no civilian had entered the premises prior to the time that you stationed yourself at the door. Had they? The nurse? Well, you know, she just came to the doorway. She was in the entryway. Came all the way into the entryway? She was in the entryway when I came down from upstairs. All right. So... Of course, you don't know if she had been in. Do you know if she had been in the den area? I don't know for a fact. No. Okay. And you don't know what, when you went upstairs, I assume that was after the paramedics arrived. Yes. And it was you and Sergeant Walling that went upstairs. Yes. Obviously, you being upstairs, you don't know what questions Darley asked the paramedics or what information they gave her or what the exchange was between Darley and Darren and the paramedics while you were gone do you? No. No way you could know that, is there? No. You aren't saying they didn't have an exchange, are you? No. Now, did you go into the living room? Sergeant Walling went into the living room before he walked out of the house. Okay. The first time. My question was, did you go into the living room? No. Okay. Did you go into the dining room? No. Okay. You said that you and Sergeant Walling went upstairs and found the infant. Yes, sir. And did you make any plans? Make any, do anything to take care of the infant or did you just leave the child there? I went over and checked the infant to see if he was injured. He, I didn't know whether it was a he or she, was standing up in the bed. They appeared to be fine to me. Okay, so you just left the infant there and went on about your business. Yes, sir. Okay, where, once you came down from upstairs... Is that when you stationed yourself at the entry? Yes, sir. Okay. And by that time, it's 2.40. As best you can tell, 2, 2.45 approximately. So is it fair to say that you had been there by that time about 10 minutes? That's probably close. All right. This happened. Everything happened pretty fast, didn't it? Yes, sir. And in that 10 minutes that you were there, is it fair to say that about 10 minutes had expired when you stationed yourself at that door at that entry? 
I would say at least 10 minutes. Well, I mean, we said 10 minutes, 20 seconds ago. Has anything changed your memory? No. Okay. Are you comfortable with 10 minutes? Yes, sir. Okay. And you were there at the front door from 2.40 or 2.45 until 3 o'clock or shortly thereafter. Is that what you said? Yes, sir. Okay. And in that time, you did all of the stuff that you told us about. And you and Walling managed to conduct a complete search of the interior of the residence, the first floor and the second floor. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And assure yourselves that everything was secure. Yes, sir. Now, you became, I suspect, reasonably familiar with the, what's called the family room here, the kitchen and the entry room. That's where you were mainly involved. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And you said, I believe, that you saw the one towel that Darley had to her neck. Is that right? Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. And... Mr. Douglas Mulder then says, mark this, please, whereupon exhibit, uh, the exhibit was marked for identification as defense exhibit number 14. Mr. Douglas then, Mulder then continues to question. Let me hand you, Officer Waddell, what has been marked for identification and record purposes as defendant's exhibit number 14. And I'll ask you to look at that. Did you have a transcript to follow Sunday? I believe it was when you heard the 911 tape. Did I have a copy of the transcript? Did you have a copy? Did the prosecutor furnish you with their rendition of what was said on the tape? Yes. Okay. Do you recognize what I've handed you? Does it look familiar? It looks familiar. Yes. Okay. And do you see yourself in there identified as P01 would be police officer one, I assume. That's what I would assume. Okay. And... You recognize that, I guess, because that's basically what you told the jury you said, at least sometime after you got there. Is that right? Yes. That obviously wouldn't be, those wouldn't be your first words when you got there, would they? No. Okay. So, I mean, where it says P01, look for a rag. You had been there sometime before you had said that, had you not? I had been there for a little bit before that, yes. Well, I mean, it makes sense. That's not, that's just not the first thing that you're going to say when you, it might have been the first thing that was picked up, but it's not the first thing that you're going to say, is it? No. Okay. Is it fair to say that you had been there, what, at that time for how long? Maybe a minute? Could have been. Could have been a minute or so? Yes, sir. Okay. You say a minute, we're talking about 60 seconds. That's probably close. Okay. Mr. Mulder then says, can y'all see that? I'm sorry. Did I move this thing around again? Can y'all see that? All right. He's speaking to the jury, being sure that they can see the information. Did you see wet towels around the family room in that entry? No, you did not. No. Okay. Is it fair to say that you're not saying that there weren't towels around there, are you? I didn't see any towels. Okay. But you're not saying there weren't towels there. There's a difference. No, right? Okay. Might have been. Didn't see them. Didn't see them. You're saying that if there were towels around there, wet towels around there, they had apparently, the routiers had done some things before you got there. Would that be fair to say? Well, I didn't see any towels. Okay, but they didn't get any towels. Nobody got any wet towels after you got there, did they? No, sir. Okay. Do you know about what time Officer Waddell, uh, Darley Routier, was taken from the scene? I don't know. Was she taken from the scene before you were relieved at the, from the post at the entry? I believe she was. So is it fair to say that she left as best as you recall sometime before three o'clock? Yes, sir. Okay. Is it fair to say that she left before three o'clock or left? Is it around three o'clock or before she left at three o'clock before you were relieved at the front door? Yes, sir. I think so. Again, you still hadn't had time at that point to make any notes, had you? No. Okay. Before, during the couple or three minutes that you were there with the routiers before Sergeant Walling arrived and you had the conversation, do you recall how many times you told Darley to sit down? Probably two or three times. Two or three times? Mm Mm-hmm. Did you tell her to lay down one time? I don't recall. I remember telling her to sit down. Okay, let me hand you again what's been marked for identification record purposes as defendant's exhibit number 14. Would that be you, P01, again? Yes, sir. 
and it says, lay down. Yes, sir. Before Sergeant Walling arrived, Waddell told Darley to lay down and or sit down two or three times. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Douglas Mulder then says, thank you, Officer Waddell. And then Mr. Greg Davis comes up to do the cross-examination, of course, by the uh, prosecution. Officer Waddell, just a couple of questions. When you looked inside the garage while Officer Walling, Sergeant Walling, actually looked in there, could you tell whether or not this garage had an overhead door? Yes. Okay. And again, as we're looking at this with the, would the overhead doors be this direction toward the alley? Yes. Right up here toward the top. Yes, sir. Could you tell from where you were whether or not that door was closed or not? It was closed. When Mr. Mulder was asking you about anything impeding your way to the sink, do you know whether or not a vacuum cleaner or any other object was laying on that floor? I didn't see it, no. It is possible that it was. Well, yes. Mr. Mulder then says, Judge, we're going to object to you. He's suggesting the answer to it. And the court then says, overruled. Mr. Greg Davis then says, you can go ahead and answer it. It's possible that it was there. Let me just ask you, Officer Waddell, as we look here at the kitchen, as we look here at the kitchen area, this island here, did you ever go over here on the this other side of the island closer to the range and to the sink? No, sir. Either on the way to the garage or on the way out of the garage, either time. No, sir. Okay. The times that Mulder has written here on these sheets, let me just ask you, do you consider these to be exact times or just estimates? estimates. Again, were you out there during this situation looking at your watch every two or three minutes to determine exactly what time you started doing something and what time you stopped doing something? No. Are you sure that you stayed on the front door until Officer Steve Wade got there to relieve you? Yes, sir. Are you sure that no one came or went once you got on that door until he got there to relieve you? Nobody but the fire personnel. All right. And was that to go in or to go out? Uh, They were going to get their stuff, their equipment, and leave. Was there ever a time, once you got there, while the defendant was still on the phone to 911, was there ever a time where you took the phone to yourself and started talking with the dispatcher? No, sir. Were there times when you'd be speaking with the defendant when you were next to her or close to her? Yes, sir. Were there other times when you may have been speaking with her when you were some distance away from her. Yes, sir. Did I understand your testimony to be to Mr. Mulder that this defendant, while you were there with her, was able to carry on two conversations at the at one time, one with you and one with the dispatcher? Yes, sir. And Officer Waddell, when you said, quote, look for a rag, can you tell us who you were talking to? The defendant. Mr. Greg Davis then says, I have no further questions. The court then says, Mr. Mulder, anything else? And he says, yeah, just a thing or two, judge. I'll try to be brief. The court then says, all right, that's quite all right. Mr. Mulder then gets up and says, would you tell us, Officer Waddell, how many people were in and out of that residence that you know of? Myself, Sergeant Walling, and there were at least two paramedics, probably six or seven. I'm not real for sure. There were some paramedics that arrived when I went upstairs also. And if I told you that there were eight paramedics out there, would you quarrel that? No, sir. Okay. You know, of course, when you were upstairs, you don't know who was in and and out of there, do you? No. Okay. You know that. Do you know how many police officers were in and out of there? Just two. All right. And when the paramedics came in there, Officer Waddell, it's been your experience as a police officer that they may move things. They aren't as careful about a crime scene and preserving the crime scene as a police officer, a trained police officer might be. Are they? No, sir. Okay, matter of fact, they move things, don't they? Sometimes, frequently. And if they have to move something to get access to an injured party, they do that and they sacrifice the crime scene for the party. Do they not? Yes, sir. All right. And you aren't telling us or telling the jury that you said you were conscious of this island here because you thought someone might be hiding behind it. Didn't you say that? The thought crossed my mind, yes. Okay. As you approached this area, you aren't telling this jury that anyone careful enough to not step on the glass would overlook a vacuum cleaner that was turned over in this area if it was there at all at that time, are you? Can you repeat that? Well, 
I'm just saying that it would be like overlooking an elephant. If you're careful enough, not you're conscious enough not to step on any glass, or you say you are, you're not going to overlook an overturned vacuum cleaner, are you? That makes sense, doesn't it? No, sir. It doesn't make sense. When I saw the glass, I was paying attention to where I was walking. I wasn't walking toward the other side of the island. Remember when I asked you if there was anything that impeded your walk from the den to the kitchen sink and you said, no, there was nothing? I said I didn't see anything. Well, that doesn't... You're telling the jury you did look toward the sink, aren't you? Yes, I looked toward the sink and didn't see any vacuum cleaner. I didn't see it. No. Okay. Mr. Mulder then says we'll offer into evidence defendant's exhibit number 13-C. Mr. Davis says no objection. The court receives it. Mr. Mulder then said that is the, the court says that last one you did up there. Okay. Mulder says, yes, sir. The court says, all right. So it's received into evidence. And Mr. Mulder then says, let me add this to it and I'll reoffer it if, if it's necessary. Mr. Mulder starts questioning and said, but you said how many people were in the scene that you're aware of? Did you say six or seven? Six or seven. Okay. So Mr. Mulder then reoffers defendant's exhibit number 13-C. Mr. Davis has no objection. At which point Mr. Mulder again continues his questioning. When, when you were here the other day, Sunday, and listened to the tape and discussed your testimony, did you hear the entire 911 tape? I don't know if we heard the whole thing or not. Would you recognize it if I were to, Mr. Mulder then asked, you don't have any objection to me playing this. And Mr. Davis says, is this the copy that we gave to you? And Mr. Mulder says, yes. Um, And he says, I don't have a problem with that. And the court then says, all right, well, let's get it played. Is that a machine that works? And Mr. Mulder says, I don't know. We'll find out. Question is, all right. You can tell in the tape when you see this transcript, you can tell when you're when Darley is answering your questions of yours and answering questions of the 911 operator. Isn't that reasonably clear? Yes. All right. So at this point, the entire 911 tape is played. And then Mr. Mulder says, now, as best as I can understand, and that's somewhat difficult to understand, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. But you're first identified on that tape about halfway into it, aren't you? I guess. You guess. I'm not sure. What are you guessing about? I don't know the time limit on that tape. I don't know at what point. I couldn't tell at what point I was there. Okay, you've admitted that you talked to her for about a minute before you're identified on this tape. Mr. Greg Davison says, Your Honor, I at this time, I the only problem I've got is Mr. Mulder referring to a document not in evidence. I've got no objections to him offering that transcript so he can refer to it. The court then says, do you want to offer the transcript, Mr. Mulder? Mr. Mulder then says, well, I don't necessarily vouch for everything in this transcript, Judge, and I'll conduct my own deal, if you don't mind. And Mr. Davis says, well, then I'll be objecting to him. If he's not going to offer it, I'm going to object to him referring to it. Court then says, sustained. Mr. Mulder says, I'll offer my own evidence. I don't need their suggestions as to when to offer something. And the court then says, we understand that. Please do not refer to that if you're not going to use it. Thank you. Mr. Mulder then questions again. Well, we agreed, questioning the officer. Well, we agreed, uh, did we not, that you were there at the residence some 60 seconds before you said, look for a rag and also told her just seconds later to lay down or sit down two or three times. I said that, yes. And it was during that time that you were gleaning your information in questioning her, wasn't it? No, sir, I didn't question her other than ask her who did it and for a description of the suspect. And she was able to talk to you and 911 at the same time. That's your story, isn't it? Yes, she was. I believe that's all. Thank you. Mr. Greg Davison says no further questions. And the court then says, all right, you may step down. Your next witness. And the next witness up for this day, which will be in another episode uh, coming up really soon, actually, will be Lieutenant Matthew Walling, who was the uh, the officer who arrived right after Officer David Waddell. There's a lot of information in this particular testimony. And personally, I find it incredibly frustrating. 
uh, because the whole time that Officer Waddell is being questioned, he is so non-responsive. He says things like, I don't remember. I'm pretty sure. I can't say for sure. I think it was. I believe. I'm not for sure. No, I guess it was or could have been. Seemed to be all of his go-tos. He evidently did take some notes, uh, but we don't know where those notes are. Uh, and these would be the notes prior to him actually writing down the formal complaint. He further says that he said a lot of things to Darley prior to the second officer arriving on the scene. However, we do know that the entire time prior to the second officer showing up, Darley is in fact on the phone with 911. So we should be able to hear some kind of this conversation that that he said that he had with Darley on the 911 call. And the transcripts are available. And I'll have the link for those in the show notes for you. Additionally, um, if you want to actually hear the full 911 call, it is in the very first episode I did uh, for this case, which is episode number 33. Furthermore, according to Waddell, um, he says that he claims he didn't hear his own voice on the 911 tape or that it didn't sound like him, which is, of course, not unusual at all. He further says that prior to Walling, the second officer arriving at the scene, he asked Darley where the suspect was, told Darley to sit down, and then tells her to tend to her child. Then he says that Darley had told him how she had gotten into a fight with the assailant. And all of this happened before Walling showed up. And the reason that this is important is that because Waddell never called in that he was at the location. So because he didn't call in and Darley was still on uh, 911 with the dispatch, if dispatch had known that there was a police officer there, they would have just let her go, likely. However, they had no idea that there was already a police officer there, and I've covered this in in previous episodes. They didn't know until the second officer arrived on the scene, at which time she can end the 911 call. So everything that Waddell is saying should be kind of audible on the 911 call. So anyway, I'm kind of looking, really looking forward to, not just kind of, but really looking forward to the testimony of Sergeant Walling, which is coming up in the next episode. And of course, he was the second officer on the scene. So until then, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I truly, truly appreciate you. I hope you understand that. And I will um, attempt to release the next trial or that next portion with Sergeant Walling uh, before too long. So until then, again, thank you. And we will talk with you soon.